I know now. <laughs> and I'm going to share it with everybody because it's very, very interesting. So let's, let's look at this, guys. So Kiwi Entrepreneur settles U.S. 3.2 million case against Bitcoin advisor. Who is this? Who sued him? This guy right here. Ben Godenzi. So real quick, um, I just want to cover this video, touch on this video, and then lead you guys to a previous video that I did. I'm going to reference it in this video as well. Um, I reported on this, this guy, Ben, about 20 days ago. Um, in one of my videos and I kind of broke down you know what the community felt about him um, as well as the payout um, as well as the kind of deals he got in the beginning as well as him being a smut poor man printing he's uncovering something that's pretty awesome as far as Intel that the community might want to know you know you've seen the poor man printing video I also want you to tap into this video that I'm about to show you now Shu Han Yu he is a veteran he is a goat he is an amazing businessman and a lot of people use tokens, the whole tokenomics concept, as an investment thing. So I posted a video between Ben as well as Dan Crothers, and I'll show you guys that as well. But this is why you guys need to pay attention, take notes, and then research for yourself so you can connect some dots. If people were listening, you wouldn't have to wait 20 days to understand that there will be FUD, and you will be able to see where it's coming from. So if you're just now finding out about this whole Ben Gadazi thing, Ben Gadenzi. I'm gonna touch on that. Something that you guys need to go and check out, rewatch, you know? And if you listen close, there's a part in there where the interviewer says, from, from his understanding, David and Dan really didn't even need any kind of token concept for investors to launch their project. These are very successful businessmen, serial entrepreneurs, and the only reason they went that route is because they had a quote, quote, blockchain professional that recommended this whole concept. And this is where we are now, as I will constantly tell you guys. I don't know anything, so you need to do your own research. But let's dive into that. What happened to GoChain? Okay. So let's get into that one. I don't know this guy, but he was the crypto guy behind the GoChain collaboration. Kiwi Tech Entrepreneur Assets Frozen in Bitcoin Fraud Case. Ben Gadazi, the one that circled in the video prior, he's the one that kind of was helping them out with their like introduction into the blockchain with the whole cryptocurrency thing. I don't know how deep he was with their tokenomics, but... David Yu came out after this, and he, of course, claimed that everything was false, and it was literally uh, allegations, you know? It wasn't true. It was alleged. And David Yu said, like, he was surprised how uh, Ben Gadazi was able to get the court to freeze his assets without any kind of real proof um, or physical proof that this stuff was going on, and it was pretty much just a accusation. Let's go to this one. It kind of looks exactly the same, but it's like, here's September 2020, and then here's February 2021. Uh, Kiwi Entrepreneur settles $3.2 million U.S. in a case against their Bitcoin advisor. After months of litigation, Kiwi Entrepreneur David Yu has had his assets unfrozen by the courts and a case against his company, Ecomi, settled. The legal action came about after Ecomi, a digital collectibles firm, went into business with a cryptocurrency influencer, Ben Gadazi. Anyways, um... This is probably why there was they have been hesitant to see which blockchain they want to go on, how they should go about it, because their advisors, their initial advisors that they started with, um, it ended up, it ended up falling apart. So, uh, Ben Gadazi, I, I don't know anything about this this guy except for the videos that I've seen him in interviews with uh, Ecomi. He, I mean, he won the case. I mean, they settled, but I mean, a lot of people settle just so you know they don't have to deal with deal with all the mess and. Uh, for a super well like David Yu, I'm sure 3.2 million, like he, was, he probably will spend that on a Pokemon collectible card or something. You know what I mean? So anyhow, but look, this is, this is you know, this is who I think Ben Gadazi reminds me of. Check it out. I'd need more capital. But banks weren't lending to guys like me. Hey, don't get up. Hey. Sit, don't get up, sit down. Okay. Okay. You take this, you mine. Okay. 
You understand? You don't pay, you know what we do? I cut you at waist. Peel your skin up over your head and tie a knot in it. You don't die from this. You suffocate. Okay. Good luck. Okay, now that we got some humor out of the way, let's dive in a little bit further into an old article um, before the lawsuit actually happened and give some insight on that. Ben Gadazi, most likely, this is from what, uh, February 19th, 2019. Ben Gadenzi most likely gets tokens for free or dirt cheap without a lockup. The team has claimed that there are no bonuses, discounts, or lockups to anyone. And then Ecomi replies, Correct, there are no lockups for private sale investors, and the OMI token is priced at one Satoshi in both the private and public sale. Team, comma, board, comma, and advisors have vesting schedules. All of this information can be found in our white paper. Also, Crypto Caliber went to the effort of re-rating the project without even bothering to read the Ecomi Collect white paper. Their review mentions products that are no longer offered by Ecomi. Crypto Caliber. So now let's read some more insight from be long before this lawsuit actually took place to get some details. Crypto Caliber, February 4th, 2019. Review update on Ecomi. In-depth review and rating Crypto Caliber. New project rating is 79%. For the full review, click this link. I'm not going to click that link because you can roll, you can scroll down and see that Ecomi comments and basically says Crypto Caliber did a half-assed job on reviewing their project. But let's read. Ben Gadenzi most likely gets tokens for free or dirt cheap without a lockup. The team has claimed that there are no bonuses, discounts, or lockups to anyone. Ecomi jumps in. Correct, there are no lockups for private sale investors, and the OMI token is priced at one Satoshi in both the private and public sale. Team, board, and advisors have vesting schedules. All of this information can be found in our white paper. Also, Crypto Caliber went to the effort of re-rating the project without even bothering to read the Ecomi Collect white paper. Their review mentions products that are no longer offered by Ecomi, which is why I'm not going to read that review. But that just gives you guys a little bit of insight on this guy being Gadenzi. Hey, thanks for the review. However, we are no longer offering Vault or Ecomi 1. Our new white paper is available on Ecomi.com. Ya klutz. Probably worth a read, ya klutz. Also, the January app updates are already available, including ERC20 on the secure wallet. Ya klutz are ghost chains. Interoperability is a marketing ploy originating with Ben Gadenzi and has somehow been coined with DOT in being a buzzword. Don't get me wrong. I'm not here just for the tech, but the truth is... And then that's number six. is like none of these are worth anything without a network effect. At best, these are products being built that I consider marketplaces, and these are worth little without one or both sides in critical mass. Who is to say if there is a breakout with individual winners and projects? I'm sure there will. The fact of the matter is this. Do not marry your bags. We do not know what the future holds. Review and evaluate your position with market trends and sentiment. Do not judge by what others say. Please, do your own research. Listen and observe carefully human behavior. None of this is financial advice. It's the reason why I invest in teams. Observe what's being built and make an informed decision on which project to invest in, who will continue and withstand any bear market. This way, I have a chance to live and invest another day. If you want to do your due diligence, if you want to see, you know, what was the mind state of the team before they left Go Chain, if you want to see the mind state of uh, this guy, Ben, um, watch the interview. Um, watch the entire interview. Take some notes. Uh, there's a part in here where, as I said before, um, the interviewer actually states that you know, hey, you guys were pretty successful and didn't even really need any kind of um, token offering, I guess. But check it out for yourself. Hello, it's Brad Laurie of Blockchain Brand. Today, I'm honored to speak about Ecomi. We have two gentlemen here from the core team. Firstly, we have Dan. He is the COO of Ecomi. Dan, thank you very much for being on the channel to explain about what you're doing since we last spoke. Thank you for having us. Looking forward to it. 
Likewise, mate. We also have someone who's well known in the space for a multitude of reasons. One of them is he is one of the arguably one of the prominent advisors for many projects. His name is Ben Gadenzi. He's another fellow Aussie. Ben, thank you also for coming on board and letting us know what you're doing with the Comey. No problem at all, Brad. Thanks for having us. No worries, mate. Now, guys, the intention for Ecomi essentially is to try and create a truly digitally, digital collectible industry. Um, gaming is the big focus for you and you want to really bring blockchain into the conversation and showcase how that can be done. But could we start with you, Dan, as COO? Tell us a bit about fundamentally what Ecomi is trying to do. Sure. Well, I think you, you touched on it um, perfectly to start off with that. You know, I think a lot of people in the crypto space are aware that this new digital asset or digital collectible uh, industry is emerging. And we've seen a couple of uh, forerunners in that industry that have been successful like CryptoKitties uh, and similar projects. But really I think there's a, a much bigger scope to, to take this whole digital collectible industry um, uh, to, the, to the mass market. I mean, the collectible industry itself uh, uh, is, is huge, $200 billion worldwide. And what really what the ultimate goal of, of Collect is to help transition that industry into the digital space um, with the core uh, functionality of the digital collectibles have true real world ownership. Um, and that's obviously something that was never, uh, could never happen before blockchain. Right, and I think that's the, that's the buzzword as well, making sure that things can transition into the real world. And right now, we're seeing a lot of different companies try to do that, not just in gaming, but in many different verticals. And we're still yet to see the proof of that conversion into it and that move into mainstream uh, verticals and mainstream business. So let's talk about that a little bit more, though, Dean, in terms of the structure for Ecomi. Firstly, your registration. Uh, where are you registered? And how is the whole business model set up? Sure. So Ecomi is registered in Singapore. Um, before we set the company up, we investigated a number of different countries and we in the end deemed Singapore as the, the top pick, uh, mostly because of their laws around um, tokens and cryptocurrency. You know, I mean, with our business and I, and I guess, you know, hopefully most other blockchain businesses, we're in it for the long term. And so we needed to ensure that the structure and the foundation of what we were setting up in a, in a business sense was going to be something that would, would pan out over the, you know, the many years that we, we plan to take Collect to the market. Right. Um, yeah. Okay. So Ben, you have a lot of experience in, in many different projects, as I mentioned before. What in your mind sets Ecomi apart from the, the other projects you've worked for and what piqued your interest to get involved at the core level? Yeah, sure thing, mate. I just, uh, I just want to quickly clarify that um, you mentioned that our core focus is gaming. That's not actually the core focus of the project. Uh, we're about digital collectibles with premium existing licensed brands. Um, you've seen through the pitch deck there where it mentions Cartoon Network, Tokidoki, things like that. These are well-established brands worldwide that we're working on. So it's uh, the collectibles, not the gaming. So initially when Dan and David approached me, I kind of brushed the project off to start with. I thought, oh, collectibles, who's, uh, who's into those? Um, a little more research and I realized that the industry is Huge, mind blowing. Um, I looked at YouTube videos and things like that with literally hundreds of millions of views on this type of thing. And what I liked about this is I'm focusing what I'm doing now on real world adoption. It's the licensing partners that Acomi have got already in line and a lot being worked on that are gonna make this possibly one of the first projects to go to the masses. We want to be able to do that seamlessly without the user having to understand or have in-depth knowledge of cryptocurrency. They just use it like a regular app um, with all the benefits of uh, blockchain and crypto in the background. So that's mm. where I'm heading and it was a perfect fit to work together. Right. And it makes a lot of sense. I have talked to some other projects recently, Ben, with regard to that focus on apps, not D-apps actually, but pre-existing platforms and applications that weren't necessarily blockchain centric, but ones that had some sort of means to transition. So you had a user base, you had a client base, you had a means in which in your case, licensing becomes relevant. But are you saying that through the course of learning about blockchain and all the things you've done, that now usership and adoption is paramount? and that being able to showcase that, that people can use these without necessarily knowing about the blockchain that, that sits underneath. 
Yeah, that's uh, absolutely critical in my view. If we're going to get the growth um, and user adoption, then personally, I want to focus on the on the user, the end user. I mean, I know there's a lot of enterprise work, um, contracts like that happening uh, with the, all the high speed blockchains we've seen come out in the last two years. Um, but I also believe the contracts those companies are getting, uh, they get revenue. There's there's no direct link to the token. Mm -hmm. That's not an ideal setup. So like you just mentioned, whether you use an existing app that has a user base and a good use case for a blockchain and a token, then I think that's a great model to integrate. Mm -hmm. Or you can find what we have with Akomi um, and the partnerships who already have the user base. And then we will look to actually create an entirely new asset class for them with the digital NFTs. Um, a lot right. of these guys, you got millions and millions of uh, files of digital artwork. They can't do much with them because if I send you a picture of Donald Duck, you can copy it and send it to Dan and send it to someone else and it doesn't have any value. But um, using the blockchain and crypto, we can make those uh, limited edition, unique and yeah. Just yeah. Get them out. We're certainly going to deep dive into the NFTs as you're alluding to, because obviously that's the means in which you combine blockchain with crypto in a unique way. But Dan, I want to ask you a bit more about the design firstly, with regard to your cross-platform nature. Um, there's references uh, again to your, your mobile desktop and web applications. Uh, there's a lot of information also about how your digital assets can be stored. So talk us through some of that aspects and also the marketplace. These aspects <laughs> really make for a holistic approach. Hmm. Yeah, so our, on the initial launch, we'll be um, on iOS and Android. Really, you know, one of the coins that we're sort of terming uh, house here is that we're putting collectibles or collectability in the palm of, of everybody's hand. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if you know of any collectors, um, but there are, there are somewhat of a bit of a secret. You know, if you don't collect, you don't really realize that there is this huge depth of, of collecting and collectors out there. Um, but we, what we find is that when people do manage to touch on that and they, they get something rare or they find a nice item, um, they, they become, you know, or some people become obsessed with, with the collecting. Mm. So the, the whole idea about, you know, with the cross platform and going to mass market is that we obviously want to be penetrating as, as many areas as we can. Uh, app is, is by far the, the, the best first channel for us to go in. Uh, as I say, because it's so accessible for everyone and it's really putting collecting in the palm of, of people's hand. Mm. Um, Quite literally. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Literally. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and it, it, that, that's, that's exciting. You could be sitting at work and you could be trading, you know, your digital collectibles um, at, alongside of your, your cryptocurrencies. Mm -hmm. And, and right. it's not just people who in, in, in uh, crypto who can do that. It'll be anybody in the mass market, uh, as Ben was alluding to before. So once we are out there with the app and established with the app, we're then going to create um, desktop platforms um, and then obviously a web-based platform as well. And again, these all just fall in line with our uh, greater goal of uh, mass adoption. You know, mm -hmm. anything really software that, that's worth its grain of salt is, is across multiple platforms. And um, yeah, that's our, that's our intention as well. Right. Now, with regard to licensing, I know, Ben, you're a huge proponent of making sure that you engage with not just mainstream media, but those who have the experience behind it. So let's talk about that for a moment. You both, both two gentlemen know the advisor, a leading advisor who's been involved with licensing for some time. The CEO of Acomi also has that experience. So Ben, tell us why it's been so important in, from your standpoint to start to engage and understand what these guys do fundamentally in a centralised uh, written framework and how they can integrate and help you um, with, with your coming project. Yeah, okay. So I suppose what I've looked at is the success of, let's say, CryptoKitties, for example, um, being a collectible on the blockchain, but very crypto orientated. You look at the 1% of crypto users and then however many percentage of the crypto users are into kitties, for example. It's pretty small. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think, uh, the essential element, like people love crypto kitties, they, they went for $120,000 each, but it's, that market is so small. If we can partner up with someone like Alfred, uh, who's been in the space for, I think it's 30 to 40 years, a long time. Um, I mean, he found pocket monsters in Japan. He called it uh, Pokemon, took it to the world, mm -hmm. the licensing hall of fame. 
uh, we can go to these existing licenses that we're all connected with and well, Alfred and David especially, and it's about creating an entirely new asset class for them. They don't have a digital collectible asset class. It's unique, identifiable. Um, it's a big market. Uh, Alfred himself says he, he wants to be the guy responsible for taking collectibles from being physical to digital. That's his next uh, final his legacy. Right. His legacy. Right. right. So someone like that on your team and David, the, these guys got the experience. I'm, I'm not a collectible expert myself. I mm -hmm. focus on the cryptocurrency, obviously, but it's a good fit. Um, everything I've seen, I, I couldn't think of a better way to take it to the mass market. It's just about integrating it in the right way. Right. Well, let's talk about perhaps the wrong word is competitors, but like systems. I want to talk about Engine, Cocos. Dan, you would know some of these different parties with regard to um, trying to focus on NFTs. So as Ben mentioned, it's not about gaming per se, or and it's not about necessarily developing games as such, but more the focus, the core central tenant of NFTs itself. Now, for those who don't know, I'm talking about non-fungible tokens, those who can, can have that price volatility as you, and, and exchangeability uh, and, and move beyond that immutability of price so that people can dictate for their own ends how they can make their own digital assets. How important has it been to see these other emerging players in this space to validate the move to NFTs? A hundred percent important. These guys are the forerunners. Um, these were the guys, you know, especially crypto kitties who, who we were looking at thinking, wow, that's, you know, the adoption of, uh, of that has gone through the roof and it became extremely popular. As, as Ben mentioned before, huge amount of monies were spent on them. Uh, they also went, you know, into the mainstream market by way of news, people mm -hmm. reporting these digital assets selling for, for huge amount of, of profit. But I think for us, um, the, the main point of difference for us is that we refer to ourselves as a purely digital collectible platform. And to give a little perspective on that, um, David, the CEO has been, I mean, there's, there's really no other way to describe that, but he is an obsessed collector. He has massive collection, super rare items. And having that knowledge and that understanding of really what makes a collector tick, why is that collector going to buy the next collectible in the set? Why are they going to complete the, the whole set of collectibles? And obviously this has been part of David's um, personal career with, with his own uh, individual collecting, but mm -hmm. also he owns games and collectible chain stores. So he is very, very much uh, deep in the, in the weeds of, of understanding collectors and what they want to collect and how to provide a product that people want to collect. So I think at, at the more fundamental level, that's probably the difference with what we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to that, we have more of a top-down approach where, as we've discussed already, the licenses are some of the key components to what we're doing. Um, so very early on, once we decided to move down this path, we started approaching um, you know, some of the top tier licenses out there because really in order to get mass adoption, um, you know, don't get me wrong, crypto kitties are cool, but compared to your favorite household brand or, or product, uh, you know, if, 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 you, if that becomes available as a product, you're going to be more likely inclined to, to purchase it. Mm. So um, that, and then I would say that the third thing that we're going to touch on is the, is the app experience itself. Um, again, is very much around the collectible industry. You can share, you can purchase, you can buy, trade, sell, you can customize. Um, it's, it's what I would say would be the most well-rounded digital collectible app experience. Right. Well, Dan, I want to also talk about the blockchain itself because you mentioned that you want to focus on licensing, but you, you, we're talking about a decentralized technology, a mechanism to drive new innovations in business. Mm -hmm. These businesses can be centralized, no doubt, and no problem with that. But the blockchain itself exists beneath you. Let's talk about you know, the context of why you have a token. And Ben, I also want to talk to you then about GoChain because GoChain is going to drive the, the blockchain mechanism of Ecomi from the outset, despite that you are agnostic by, by, by intent and by business models, you still are going to utilize certain blockchains to start. So let's start with your own design, Dan. You know, why the token and, and how do you specifically use blockchain irrespective of GoChain for a moment? 
So um, with the token, obviously we came into this whole business idea through cryptocurrency and with the understanding of what cryptocurrency can bring and the, and the benefits that it can bring. Then with the learning more about NFTs, um, it is really an, an absolute natural marriage to have these digital collectible assets as NFTs on a blockchain with ownership. In fact, if, that, if those pieces weren't in place, it would be impossible for us to create an application like this. As Ben said before, I could send you a JPEG of whatever, but because you have no ownership over that, you have no rights, there's really nothing you can do about it. So uh, really number one, the, the core component of the blockchain is, is the ownership. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, you know, I mean, as a lot of your, your users probably know anyway, secondly is the, is the counterfeit protection, the provenance, and all of these aspects are, have become very important when we're talking with licensors. And a lot of the licensors, you know, originally were quite sort of skeptical about what we were doing. And it has required uh, probably a good 12 months of, you know, meetings back and forth to help them understand, you know, how the blockchain works, how we're using it to, A, protect their assets. Because as soon as we say digital, they're like, oh, it's going to be copied. A right. counterfeit. They're, they're, they're extremely afraid of counterfeit. So... Um, yeah, that at the, at the core level, that is, that is the use of, of blockchain for this project. Okay. Now, Ben, you know a lot about GoChain. You're the, uh, my understanding is you're the advisor for GoChain. Can you talk yeah, us through great. why there's this connection between Ecomi? Because obviously, me as a researcher and an educator in the space, I noticed it very quickly. And to be fair and to be objective, I wanted to really pose the question more than anything. You know, was it because of you? that there's this correlation or was it you know something that the team actually noticed as well uh, well yeah um initially i'll say that i am an advisor to GoChain, been there since the beginning and obviously also an advisor to Akomi. um part of my role is working on partnerships and finding what's in the best interest of all the projects i work with GoChain team is to date um i'll exclude Akomi from this comment but the best team I've ever worked with. Um, I'm a big fan of the GoChain platform. I stopped following all the other blockchains because everyone and his best mate and a couple other guys have got one. It's, yeah, it, it got out of control, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, GoChain is quite a simple fork of Ethereum. It's not overly complicated. Uh, they've changed their system, so it's a uh, point of uh, proof of reputation, um, which I'm personally a fan of, I think, having... 50 nodes in different countries in different industries. Uh, you can look at Dish Network and whoever else they've got on board. There's no association. Those guys are never going to collaborate to take over the network. I think it's much more secure. Mm -hmm. uh, GoChain's currently doing 1,300 transactions per second versus you're probably more aware of the current ETH than I am. But yeah, it's, a, it's, it's about 15. Yeah, there you go. So uh, 100 times faster. Um, it works, it's smooth, it's fast, it's easy. Mm -hmm. And if there was problems, we could always transfer. Um, they will be up to the 13,000 transactions in the near future. Mm -hmm. uh, Ethereum was never going to handle what we're looking to do here. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully, as we go, GoChain will be able to keep up. And if it can't, we will happily look at other options. But at right. this stage, it's the best fit. And Ben, I, the reason why I ask is because I think it's fair in this space. There's a lot of blockchain bullshit. You're a fellow Aussie. We don't like to mince our words. But when we see advisors, it always has to be asked because we don't know the agenda of many of these parties. We don't know if it's because they're getting huge numbers of tokens. We don't know if it's because they're going to, you know, sell and then move on to another project. And we have seen that happen with certain actors in the space. That's, oh. that's why I wanted to ask really directly with you what your connection is and what your intention is behind this, because people will, will suppose anyway. No, oh, be. they will, no doubt. Um, yeah, I've worked with GoChain, I've been paid by GoChain, and I am uh, have no issues with that. But if I thought there was a better option for Ecomi to start on, I would put that forward because I'm with the Ecomi team full time now. Got it. Uh, okay. And I'm the best. Yeah, and Ben, on that note, let's talk about the agnostic nature of Ecomi because you mentioned that you would support in the future uh, the prospect of onboarding other blockchains because GoChain, from my understanding, is not necessarily the only option. So, Dan, talk us through that. There's a built-in standard just for GoChain in the way you've structured it, but does that mean that it's the only option? Um, I think just to touch on a few things first about GoChain, um, just, just to clear anybody's um, view out there, 
when when Ben came to us, he, there was a, a number of different options that that he presented us. And you know, both David and myself, you know, we've we've been in business for a long time, and really, you know, we we did our own extensive due diligence on all of the the uh, platforms chain. available to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the chains available to us. Um, and in the end, you know, as Ben mentioned, you know, there are a ton of different blockchains out there that we could have used. But for me personally, what it came down to was the team at blockchain. Jason, Travis, Adam, the community guy, like these guys are very, very high caliber. And for us, um, coming into the blockchain space, um, granted a bit later than, than most people, David and I have been in it for about two years. Um, that was a huge important factor for us that the, the people in there, we know that we could trust them, that they're, they're not going to just fold and take the token and do this and do that. Mm -hmm. You know, we met numerous times in person. We had, we had many conversations and in the end it, it really comes down to the team because that, that tech can be produced by a number of different people. Mm. Um, so, sorry, just, just remind me so, what the question was. So, that's fine. So I appreciate your explanation. Now, given that you've decided to go with GoChain first, you've explained your own uh, perspective from the team. It wasn't just about Ben's position, but again, you can you are agnostic by by definition, by technology, by the licensing. So you could technically go and extend this relationship with GoChain into other platforms in the future, should you deem them appropriate. So my question is despite that you are now designed as a specific GoChain standard with your NFT, are you going to also look at the prospect of expansion, potentially, if you can see other blockchains that are you know, ticking the box, you know, as Ben's explained from his position that GoChain does now? Mm. Um, absolutely. One of the reasons that we have taken this approach is because, as I mentioned before, we really are a long-term business. And as part of doing our planning, and our sourcing our technology providers, um, we need to do some kind of uh, risk assessment. And part of that risk assessment is knowing and understanding that blockchains can literally come and go. And that would, would have posed a huge issue for us if we had been uh, siloed with one particular um, chain. Mm. So with with regard to the agnostic side, we've really done it for two reasons. Number one is for the is to be risk averse in the future in case whatever happens, we don't want anything to happen to the platform and we need that flexibility to be able to shift if mm. we need to. And number two is that, as I mentioned earlier, the you know this whole digital collectible space is emerging and there is bound to be people out there, you know, whether they're, whether they're individual brands or whether they are people who might approach us or we approach that are going to have different standards in the future as this um, technology and industry evolves. Mm. So for us, you know, with our goal of wanting to be the, you know, the number one platform out there for digital collectibles or the, the Netflix for digital collectibles, it's very important that we don't silo ourselves into a box to say, hey, you know, if you want to come on with us, you have to be like this. Right. And obviously right. for those who support your, your utility as well, that's imperative, especially given, and we'll discuss more about the nature of the raise and what's, mm. what's been changed since then. But it is important because they want to know that you're going to have that flexibility um, as, you, as you build this platform, as you build what you can do. Now, um, I want to talk to you, Ben, about this because you've done a lot of work on this since you became involved directly with the raise, uh, you changed the metrics quite considerably. So let's start, at, let's start with what you did, Ben. What was your findings? What was your experience when you arrived in the Akomi scene, given that you have had so much involvement at that level with other projects as well? Yeah, no worries, mate. Um, initially, when we came across the team in, it was July, I think, last year, um, started working on theories. Um, it was mid-bear market. Everything was going downhill. Um, we all got carried away, myself, you, every other investor. And we invested in things that we probably shouldn't have. Yep. There was a lot of hype and we all made mistakes. And I had to start looking at the projects that were all going downhill and why this was happening. I yep. was focused on a, on a way to change that. Um, all these guys that raised January, February, there's too much money around. Um, Huge discounts for VCs, different levels of investors, got different tiers, different prices, um, mm. different peggings on their ETH price. I personally saw that as one of the major downfalls is 
a VC comes in with a 50% discount. He sells half his SAF to retail a guy down the board, down the road at 1.5x. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's made his money back, and now he also probably has unlocked terms depending on how early they were. A lot of seed guys were unlocked. That yeah, I mean, really? as Aussies, we could just call them blockchain bastards, really, because let's get real. It's just another way of affirming injustice, because if you trust the system, you want to also make sure things are fair. That's what blockchain supposed to be. But what you're saying is just simply true. There was a lot of hierarchy um, in built in. There was a lot of access from the early entry. So the earlier you were in, the better deal you got. But again, it wasn't about the blockchain. It was about money. It was about getting yeah. as quickly as possible. Absolutely. And unfortunately, I think um, some of us, not all yet, but some of us came to realise that was one of the biggest downfalls. And I think it was uh, largely responsible for what happened to the market. Because if you can come out already in profit when a token goes live, you still got some in your pocket. Mm. You don't care if you sell them for a 90% discount. That's just more profit. Right. We see that. Everyone panic sells. It continues downhill. Um, specifically with the case of Akomi, uh, they did have a very traditional sale model structured there mm-hmm. and if I was going to come on board it was going to be a requirement that I was going to be able to change it and rework the entire system. Mm-hmm. Um, fundraising was slow back then uh, we all know it was very difficult so their model actually included a redistribution of unsold tokens there was 50 cent 50 percent being sold to the public mm-hmm. and whatever wasn't sold would be redistributed and now if you redistribute those tokens it deflates the value um, then you've got the bonuses. The team doesn't end up owning too much in value wise. Um, and yeah, it's just a, it's a snowball effect. Uh, right. so I want to come in, I want to make it even across the board. Don't care who you are, where you came from, what brand name VC you've got attached to your shirt and make it all the same price. Uh, right. And, I, and Ben, that's, that's good to hear because we need more of these kinds of changes to remove all of that in, in injustice and in, in inequity. Because obviously it's about trying to make sure that we can be in here for the long term, all of us, whether we're speculate, uh, speakers of the space, whether they're speculators, whether they're you guys building out uh, teams or leading them through your network, then we still want these things to succeed for the long term. And this is the only way that can be done through transparent means. But I want to move across now to the nature of the changes that you made. Now, yeah. you say that you changed everything to, to be egalitarian and to, to be... Um, apply for everyone regardless of their position but what were the numbers involved how does that actually work so especially pegging because uh, my understanding is that if typically you could get in earlier based on the ETH peg that would be different to point to simply because of the way the ETH has changed in value yeah correct and uh, the downfall of ETH uh, led to a lot of problems there throughout 2018 so we restructured it to a Bitcoin peg okay. um, and the easiest and also a very unique model that I think may have been done previously, but not entirely like this, is I want to peg one OMI token to one fraction of a Bitcoin being one Satoshi. Mm-hmm. Make it a uh, one-to-one peg at the lowest possible level. And whenever you contribute your Bitcoin, it doesn't matter if it was in February, November, March, you contribute a Bitcoin, you get 100 million tokens. You could have been holding them since they were 50 cent Bitcoins, or you could have bought them at 20 grand. Um, I saw that as the fairest possible way to do it. And when we do the IEO for the public sale, that's also going to sell at one Satoshi per token. No bonus, no discount, no seed rounds. And we'll go live onto the exchange at that price. And mm-hmm. based on the, the work of the project... Um, it will be a testament to the seed. Because, because quite simply, you see a lot of IEOs trying to inflate price, trying to really get a true launch for their, to get attention through the price. So Ben, are you saying that you're literally trying to change the narrative of the IEO as well in what you're wanting to do? Yeah, not just the IEO, Brad, but I want to change the narrative of the entire space. I want to wipe out those discounts. Uh, I want to wipe out the vesting as well. Um, Mm -hmm. I used to believe in it, but we all uh, can grow up and realise things weren't what we thought they were. Mm -hmm. Um, I know exchanges now are demanding ludicrous lockups. not for themselves, but usually for the private sale investors, we see tokens coming out with a 3% supply. And yes. there's only one reason for that, and that's artificial inflation. They mm-hmm. want to pump it. They want people to talk about this exchange or that exchange. It went 25x. But that's not a reflection of the company and what they're actually producing. Right. And, is and then, first of all, 
you know, speaking with a, a lot of experience here, you really do know the whole gamut, the whole game that, that, that's been played in the past. Now, for you to say these kinds of things, you know what that means. And that is simply that for those big players, whether they be the, the, the exchanges, whether they be the crypto VCs, many of them are going to be listening to this kind of comment and, and know that you're going to be, you're, you've transitioned into this uh, speaker for the future of blockchain. So many of these, these guys align to make sure they can ensure their crypto cartel is strong. Are you concerned at all that you know, you're, you're a minority now in this space and that you're trying to change this and hopefully to transition to something of a majority? No, I'm not worried at all, Brad. Um, I got into this space to, to help people I know initially and that kind of uh, grew out pretty quickly to, to meet new investors and things like that. And I've seen a lot of people make a lot of money and lose a lot of money, myself included. Um, so I'm here to to make a change. There's going to be people that don't like it. There's going to be FUD. Mm -hmm. There'll be truth. There'll be lies, whatever you want to call it. It doesn't matter. Um, but I believe with the project I've partnered with, the, the Comey obviously, um, and their business model and what we've integrated on the token side, um, I believe this can actually look to change the future of how things are done. Um, I could be wrong, but I'm prepared to give it a damn good go. And in six months time, if a Comey is successful the way we believe it will be. The market could be going down. We'll continue to go in the right direction. And people are going to look back at this and go, hang on, the guy we used to fart and hate on, he's actually got a pretty good model and could change the standard, hopefully. Well, Ben, I appreciate, you know, again, the, the way in which you're speaking because there's just no bullshit. I can tell from what you're saying that you really do you want to change the game. Now, let's explore this a little bit more with regard to the economy token with you, Dan, for a moment. Dan's... Uh, uh, Ben's made a lot of changes that arguably are very proactive, but uh, when you first started to, to work on this, what was your intention? I need to ask you this because as Ben said, um, the token model was different. So what were you hoping to do when you first started, when you had the previous setup, um, as opposed to now? What have you learned from having get, getting Ben on board to like, literally change the game? Hmm. I think the biggest learning is just the the way that Ben has refined the the whole token metric to be much more in line with the the whole digital collectible NFT blockchain space. Um, previously, the the token metrics were, uh, you know, they were okay as as Ben mentioned, they were fairly traditional. But I think the model that we have now, and you know what what we've discussed internally anyway is. Uh, a format and a model that can be applied to future businesses who want to look at some kind of tokenomics or token metric to underpin their business. Mm -hmm. uh, for us, it's it's slightly easier because we are directly working with NFTs in the in the digital space. Um, but yeah, the whole sort of ecosystem that's been set up now is. Um, uh, a lot more pure than than what it was previously. Right, that makes sense. Now, Holochain, for example, they've done something interesting. They've uh, established what's known as a price floor. And my understanding is that's public in the way that you've designed it as well to secure the longevity of this. So either of you gentlemen, perhaps Ben, with your you know knowledge of metric design, have you made sure that you've built in these price floors to you know continue yeah. and support this? I, um, I wouldn't actually refer to it specifically as a price floor. I know okay. some people are. Um, we're sending a base level at the lowest fraction of the Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And we're only gonna trade our token with BTC pairings. Mm -hmm. um, but that being said, there could always be a rogue exchange that wants to come along and this unique pair or USDT pair. But uh, the majority of our trading volume and price support liquidity for our investors will be on primary exchanges that we're working with and we will list just BTC pairs. Uh, like you said, uh, one of the other few projects I know that did do a one Satoshi token model was was Holochain, although their, their metrics overall were very different, but that had a, a, a great impact. These people love low sat tokens, they love cheap tokens. Uh, some people think, oh no, there's 750 billion tokens, but you got to look at the math, the numbers of tokens doesn't actually matter. It's the market cap we need to be, be watching. Got it. And I mean, you look at tokens now out there in the in the 10 to 20 sat range. They're, they've got huge, huge liquidity and volume because traders love them. You buy at 10 sats, sell at 11 sats, you've made a 10% profit. It's only gonna move one sat. Um, so yeah, it's gonna be attractive to traders and there's gonna be liquidity on those pairs. Well, let's talk about exchanges too, Ben. I mean, you're an, you're an advocate for cleaning up the exchanges. 
Now, your, the IEO is also coming in on, on to a, an exchange that perhaps isn't known by many. Now, I want to ask you, firstly, why, either of you, why you chose this exchange? And also, are you at all concerned, quite sincerely, about liquidity from the outset? Because as you both know, ERC20 have prominence in most exchanges, and many of them want those pairings to really you know, adopt uh, your, your token itself. So are you concerned in any way you might be precluding yourself from liquidity initially? from this exchange you've talked about as well? I'm uh, not worried um, about the liquidity initially, Brad. There's going to be enough liquidity there. Um, we'll, we'll make sure of that initially. Um, mm -hmm. But the real liquidity is going to come for the people that want to see this project through. Um, and we can probably explain to you later when discussing the token utility on how we also provide liquidity when the app is live. Sure. Uh, when it comes to exchanges, we have selected to go with BitForex. Mm -hmm. um, I've spoken to the majority of uh, main exchanges that you, you everybody would know, at least 10 to 12 of them, 10, maybe 15, um, about doing the IO with their exchange. And end of the day, it came down to almost all of them. There was only uh, one other exception. Um, but yeah, almost all exchanges either demanded that you change your private sale terms, lock them up for extended periods of time between 12 and 24 months. Mm -hmm. That goes against what I believe in, as we've just discussed before. Yep. I don't. It's uh, it's right to be changing private sale terms. Some of these guys invested almost a year ago. Um, well, we both know what that's like. <laughs> as Australians, we can invest and we know what yeah. that feels like. Oh, that's right. And they, these guys were given terms. They put their money in. They sat back, watched the market crash. Yep. Now you're going to come along and tell them, oh, you can have two percent on day one. You have five percent a month later. Um, I don't agree with that. Mm -hmm. So that ruled out most of the exchanges. Then the vast majority of them as well also want a large token supply for themselves. So mm -hmm. you go ahead and 2% liquidity on day one, but the exchange has got all those tokens and they want it pumped. They'll do their own market making and end of the day, they'll make the money. Right. So, so let's talk about the threats then. Obviously, you had a good conversation with them. What were the, yeah. the, the big ticker items for them that you really made you decide to advocate for them? Uh, with the with the Akami team? Sure thing. That, uh, they were easy to talk to, easy to get along with. Um, they responded quickly, uh, conversations, phone calls. Um, most guys are pretty slow. There's also a long waiting list for IEOs. They're the current hype. So you're looking at three to six months. Mm -hmm. uh, after a few conversations, they were happy to move us to the front of the line. Uh, they liked the project. They were happy to list us only to a Bitcoin pair. They would do our token raise at one Satoshi, only collect Bitcoin. They don't want tokens off us uh, for them to sell themselves. And they agreed not to change the vesting terms on our, on our private partners, our private investors. So it doesn't get any better than that. I think it's uh, honest, there's integrity. And I'd rather go with a, a small, relatively unknown exchange that does have integrity rather mm -hmm. than a, a mass exchange that's just going to bend you over. And okay, that's good want. to know. Because I, I put a tweet out to literally inquire on that exact question and you've explained it. And the reason I ask is because some of the exchanges, Ben, that are small are equally as shitty as some of the bigger ones. So you don't really know sometimes unless you hear from people like you what the experience has been. Um, but do you also understand what I mean about some of the comments made about some of the other uh, lesser known exchanges that are equally trying to do that kind of manipulation, but they just yes. don't have the liquidity? Yeah, absolutely. There's definitely smaller exchanges uh, demanding that you change your terms, that you pay them extortionate fees. Mm -hmm. um, I'll even say go as far as saying that they demand market making requirements on your, on your token price while they hold tokens. Yep. And, and we know that happens. Yeah, they can be big and they can be big or small, but, but it's out there. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, like I said, I just liked uh, BitForex based on their integrity and the liquidity from our project is going to come from the, the long-term development of a, a viable product. Got it. Okay. Well, thank you again for your transparency there. I appreciate it. Now, one of the things I did want to ask you both is with regard to the team. Um, I had a look through. One of the things I have to uh, uh, be honest about, I was surprised at the re relatively limited technology um, experience from the core team. Have I missed something there, Dan? Are there members of the team that are really savvy engineers um, that are, you know, currently building out the coming tech or is it truly an entrepreneurial focus that what the team's trying to do? Um, our team is weighted 80% in terms of developers. Okay. Um, we have, uh, obviously, our CTO, um, Michael. Um, he was previously headed up the 
uh, blockchain in initiative at KPMG here in Taiwan. So he's very well versed. Um, and then when he, he joined the team, he also pulled a couple of key people from his team um, who were looking at other opportunities in the space such as this. So uh, in terms of the blockchain tech, um, I, I feel that we are, we're fully oh. adequate. Okay. And you know, the reality is, is that we're a flexible and growing team. Right now, the, I would probably say 80% of the development team is very focused on app development. Um, and then there's the, the AR, AR functionality side. So, yeah, I think our, our team is, is spread uh, in, a, in a diversity that we need right now. Right. Now, what about with regard to the, one of the most complicated things to talk about, and Ben, this is going to be a tough one, and that is the, the token economic modelling. And that's where we talk about how on earth does that particular token value correlate with the growth of Ecomi. It is really something that hasn't been achieved or evidenced in almost any blockchain to date. But you've come up with a novel idea of burning via the token structure. So, Ben, can you talk us through why that model is going to be important? I know Engine's doing something similar to affect yep. the supply. So would you like to know specifically about uh, the burning side or the overall yeah. utility? If, if you could talk well. through the burning side, mate, between the standard, that, um, that GO standard that's being used and the actual token itself of Ecomi, I understand there's something happening there to affect the supply to ensure that you have that long term. As far as you're, you're talking there with regards to burning, I'll just uh, clarify what's gonna happen. As you come okay. into the app, um, regular app store, it's easy for the user. They just use their iTunes account. They see a uh, little dragon that they uh, really want to buy. It's $9. Yep. So they say, yeah, I'll buy this dragon for $9. We, we don't want them to confuse them too much. Mm -hmm. And they'll put in their card. Now on the back end, uh, this is where the tech team will take care of it. But on the back end, that $9 will purchase... Um, tokens directly out of our reserve. It's actually mm -hmm. facilitating a purchase from the exchange, um, but we have a, a currency token reserve on the spot just so it's instant. Okay. Um, we purchase those tokens out, uh, expenses get dispersed, and then it facilitates the buy from the exchange. So that money is going back in to make sure the, the token has value. Now that okay. token, get your say 20,000 OMI tokens on the back end again, and they then get exchanged for the Dragon Go721 NFT that you want to add to your collection. Mm -hmm. so the 721 gets converted over into your name, all the blockchain benefits, of course, and those Go20 tokens, they're technically, in my mind, they're used. You've used them and you've exchanged them for a 721. Mm -hmm. You've literally done a swap. So they're no good anymore. They've, they've been used. They are now a, a 721 NFT. So they get sent off to a, a zero uh, a zero address, zero contract, where they're not used again. Um, yep. And technically that would take them out of the system. Got it. And that's going to affect the supply. That's where I'm alluding to it because that's the imperative. This is part of that crypto economic modeling that technically can work in terms of um, longitudinally reducing that supply because of use. Yeah, that's... Uh... That's right. It's, it's an actual utility of a token. You're, you're using it to exchange it for a 721 mm -hmm. and therefore it's discarded because you don't need it anymore. It, it's been used. Mm -hmm. um, like you use some fuel in your car. It's, it's gone. It's gone. You don't Got just... It. Uh, now, Ben, how, how do we talk about this in the context of payment coins, though? And I raise this in Twitter quite sincerely. Now, if, we're, mm -hmm. if, I'm, if I'm that, you know, that boy who loves collectibles and I want to go and pay with my fiat, pay to the service and, and get that NFT, is it fair to suggest that part of that utility model you have is actually a payment system? Yeah, absolutely. Within the uh, within the ecosystem itself, uh, the only token is considered a, a payment and a utility token to interact throughout the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, that's one aspect of it, no doubt. Yep. Okay. Got it. Now, I, I suppose that the next thing to talk about is uh, David himself. How integral has it has he been? Um, Dan, with regard to leading this out, because he's an entrepreneur, um, is he forging partnerships that are beyond measure? Because you know the names that you mentioned before, they're they're the, they're the real deal in terms of licensing and, and mainstream businesses. But what's he doing right now to build out the blockchain partnerships, to build out more partnerships that potentially can really expand this globally? Um, that work is ever and ongoing, and it has been for 
since since we started this project, or, or more specifically, since we started the, the collect part of the project. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, as I mentioned before, David has has been an entrepreneur for 20 plus years, and he's already been heavily involved in the gaming and collectible space. So it's really the partnerships, you know, like people ask me qu quite often, you know, how does Al come on board? How do you get these guys on board? It's not literally somebody's called them up in the past three months and say, hey, would you like to, to join our team? Especially the, with a big, you know, big check in hand. That's the thing. A lot of people think. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, like we're a startup, you know, like we don't, we're, we're not going after people with giant checks. Like that's not our, not our game. Mm. Um, so all of the relationships that we have now, um, such as Alfred, um, some of our very high end advisors um, who, who may not come so much into play now, but will come into play uh, as the business starts developing, um, the relationship with the licensors, all of these connections have been built up over David's 20 year career. Mm -hmm. And that's why we are lucky enough to have these um, relationships in place. And I think it's why many other blockchain um, ventures might struggle because quite often they're built from what I term from the bottom up where they find a cool idea, they build some tech, they see that there could be an opportunity for it. And then they have to go out and find people who they don't know because they haven't had a career, you know, um, building up a database of these, uh, what have now become our key partners, thanks to David's. Mm. So what's in the pipeline, Dan? What's coming? Give us some examples, you know, as the COO, um, what kind of brands are out there that we don't know, perhaps, that are lining up to work with the Comey? Mm. Well, all of the brands that we are going to launch with will be announced between now and the launch. Mm -hmm. um, for many of them, we are under contractual obligation that we can't say who they are. And that's not something that's related to us. Um, any company out there who has purchased a license from a company um, generally cannot use that license to promote their fundraising of their business. And there's also a lot of other rules around it, like, you know, we can't announce who, I mean, this is with certain uh, mm -hmm. licenses, we can't announce until X weeks before the app is, uh, is becoming available or even until the app is available. Because so, of NDAs, I see. Because of NDAs and, mm -hmm. you know, also like, you know, we have to also be realistic as well. Um, you know, blockchain and crypto in, in the real world, unfortunately still has some negative connotation. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I was alluding to before about how it has taken a while for us to get these top tier licenses over the line because, you know, we need to communicate with them that blockchain is amazing. Yes, mm -hmm. there are some people out there in crypto who are going to scam you and all that, but the benefits that this can bring to us and to their, their business and their assets is, is huge. Right. So there's definitely a lot in the pipeline. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, our aim, our goal is to be the Netflix of digital collectibles. And mm -hmm. that comes to one thing and that's content. And that's right. why people like Alfred, why the connections David has made over the past 20 years have, have become so fruitful. And I, you know, I really look forward to the day when I can actually, we can actually announce um, some of these yes. partnerships. Yes, I'll look forward to that too, just so I can understand the magnitude of some of them. And I'm guessing that some of them are substantial and global already, given that the names have already been released with Alfred, for example, with, and with David. I mean, some of these brands are already well and truly global. Um, but I wanted to also talk to you about that triple M and I'll explain what I mean. Right now, once something posts list, whether that's IEO, whether that's on any exchange, media and market making, those two things, they tend to have really, as Ben alluded to, and, and not always in a very uh, litigious or in a very uh, ethical manner. Those things have precedence. Now, in your instance, obviously media is really important. Liquidity provision is going to be imperative. That's done on Wall Street in a very legitimate way. You must have liquidity provision there. But are you making sure that the media, for example, is paramount to this you know, post-launch so that you can educate, you can inform, and you can make sure that in the interim period that people can support this utility as it unfolds? Because it's going to take a bit of time to get known. Are you, I, I, so I'm asking you, are you working with a media plan? I mean, Ben's a masterful market, marketer anyway, so I'm sure there's something going on. But mm. is media paramount and, and are you also making sure there's some sort of liquidity provision or, or are you monitoring that in some way? Uh, absolutely. You know, as, as you mentioned, um, you know, media goes hand in hand with, with what we're doing. And it, it's not only that it goes hand in hand, but it gives people confidence that, you know, what we're producing is, is what we're saying that we're going to do. So 
post post IEO and between then and the launch is when we're going to start announcing. Um, it is a little bit of a catch-22 for us because, you know, we also want to be keeping some of our big announcements for the app launch for mm -hmm. people who aren't necessarily in the crypto space. Um, but we certainly have partners that we are going to be announcing, uh, you know, over the next few months um, to give people confidence that, uh, you know, there are some real legs behind the project. Um, yeah. Right. And what about you, Ben? I mean, you know more than almost anyone in crypto about marketing. Let's be real. You also know a lot of the people in the network. What are your thoughts on the way in which that your the PR needs to change and how is Ecomi, you know, leading that out? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, we are here in the crypto phase initially, so there is going to be crypto marketing involved. That's, uh, mm -hmm. that's standard as far as I'm concerned. Uh, projects need to be known about. So mm -hmm. we go out there and people talk about them and show off little snapshots of the app or the, the demo dragon. Yep. But once we we move through that initial IEO phase, then we want to start focusing. We want to build our crypto community, but we want to start focusing on the existing communities from uh, the real world brands. And yeah, media is going to be critical. Absolutely. Um, Got it. And Ben, I want to ask you directly, and I've never had a chance to ask someone this who's had the role before in many instances, but do you think that sometimes the crypto marketing aspect is a bit inflated or a lot inflated? Because, because obviously me being in the space of edu crypto education, I see that. I see prices even to, to be far, far ex ex in excess of the typical amounts that you'd pay in mainstream media. So does it ever concern you? of this capitalization from the influencer side because it's yeah, look, such a new market. Yeah, look, crypto is expensive for, for marketing, no doubt. And I guess that's because it's such a small and niche industry. Um, marketing, um, influencer marketing, whatever you want to call it, is it's everywhere. It's worldwide. Whatever industry you're in. Um, I used to be in the supplement game and we used influencers and mm -hmm. so did everybody else that's very big in that market. Um, I don't think there's much difference to crypto. I think it's all very much the same. The only major difference is it's a smaller market, a smaller niche. There's only a handful of, uh, let's say, crypto influencers versus fitness influencers. So, so they can charge stage, more. They that. can charge more. Because that makes a lot of sense. The projects want exposure. Hey, I'm available. I've got 100,000 fans and, mm. oh, cool, I like your project, but it's going to cost you. Got it. But Ben, what about when they don't do the research and they don't look and they just take the money and promote shit? Yeah, well, I don't believe in that. That's like uh, someone going out and promoting isogenics because <laughs> it's a lot of crap. But as long as they get paid, they'll do it. So there's no difference here either. Um, mm. So how do we, they, they how do we clean this? The project. So Ben, how do we clean this space up? How do we clean space up so we represent good projects and we encourage <laughs> it and espouse this kind of transition? Well, I think we did a lot of weeding out during 2018. Um, but there's two two ways to look at the marketing there. I think a lot of guys did believe in projects um, and they promoted what they believed in, what they invested in. So there's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. But they also lost money on it. So then you've got guys like you just mentioned who are promoting anything and everything. They don't care what it is. They mm -hmm. may not even read the deck or the white paper. Like, yeah, give me a couple of thousand bucks and I'll say it's good. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I want to see those guys gone. And Likewise. So Likewise, that's why I wanted to be frank with you because I knew you'd answer that pretty directly. Now, getting back to Ecomi for a moment, um, I want to talk to you, Dan, about the roadmap because obviously there's some key milestones that you plan beyond the IEO. What are some of them that you really want to mention today that are really important as you build you know, this year? Um, I think the key one for, for your users um, would be that when the app launches, we are going to be uh, inviting a, a very select group of people um, and that's going to be they're going to be invite only they're going to be people who are you know in in the real world media and in the crypto media um, as well as a, a a large pool of the either the, the crypto public or the the general general public and uh, the the advantage of getting into this sort of trial period so to speak is that we will be creating some very limited edition uh, digital collectibles from the brands we have on board now. Mm -hmm. um, these will be similar to what's going to come out when we actually launch the app, but they're called, what's known as a, as a trial collectible. In the collectible world, let's say um, a, an artist makes a, a small statue or a small sculpture, they might make 15 or 20 of them to begin with. That's mm -hmm. what's referred to as an artist proof. And generally, it, it won't be numbered, it'll have a special certificate of authenticity. And because these are the very first ones that have made it out there, 
they generally retain significantly more value um, because of this fact. So during this trial period, um, where for us as a company, we're going to be using it to really gather a lot of data on, you know, how many collectibles are people buying? How many sets are they completing? What type of products are they buying? Um, and in return, um, uh, uh, the users who are invited into this platform have the opportunity to get their hands on what could potentially be very valuable collectibles coming up in the future. All right, that's quite a pragmatic approach. It also allows people to experiment and get potential value out of it. Have you thought more, Dan, also about the inherent risks with the, the, the unleashing of this in terms of scalability and pressure on the blockchain? Because CryptoKitties was an interesting test at the time mm. and it was complete failure in terms of bottlenecks. So have mm. you done stress tests? Have you done a lot of the due diligence in terms of uh, your team? You mentioned 80% of them are dev, dev-centric. So have they made sure that they're ready to utilize a blockchain to start to experiment at this kind of scale that you're needing. Because as Ben knows, we need immense scale when we're talking about global um, movement into mass adoption arena for blockchain. Yeah. Well, that was one of the reasons we did partner with GoChain because even right now, um, you know, their TPS is very good and in the future, it's going to be a lot higher. Mm-hmm. But you've really addressed what one of the, the key risk factors that we addressed moving into this business, which is the reality is blockchains out there now literally ca- cannot handle a mass market. No. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, I have a lot of faith in this project, so we are obviously hoping for thousands, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of users down the line. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's very important that the system doesn't break. It's going to be terrible for everybody. Mm-hmm. So in these early stages, we've actually adopted more of a hybrid approach where we are using blockchain for all its advantages now, mm-hmm. but we are also using traditional solutions to ensure that um, we aren't going to be bottlenecked by, by any of the technology that's out there. Right. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Now, I wanted to finish off and ask you a couple of things about your community engagement. Before we do, um, there was a claim made that I read uh, in some of your, I think it was your white paper or in your pitch deck. And it says that this huge global market is about to enter the digital realm and with ownership of digital collectibles recorded on the blockchain. And it went on to say that you want to be leading that industry. Do you feel like you're already doing that? by you know, having these connections, these licenses, are you potentially going to be the, the leading uh, representative of this kind of industry for the future? Well, that is 100% our goal. Mm-hmm. Okay, so, so, so to do it well, Ben's explained the marketing strategy. What about the community engagement though? How are you gonna get the crypto community and the devs more importantly, I, think I would argue this is one of the most crucial things to develop and use uh, not not just go chain, but develop um, apps that can be can be supported through Akomi. Well, I mean, we actually don't have a have a need or, or demand for any developers. So developers won't be able to create anything on our platform. You know, okay. we we create the product that we think is the best for the collectible market, mm-hmm. uh, and and then we produce that as an app. Like, what, about, like any- what about though getting devs into your team? Are you considering that? Getting more I mean, devs to build for internally to build out the apps that or enhance the app that you do have. Yeah, I mean hiring uh, and resources is is a key thing for any company, but I don't believe that we'll have any issues bringing on anybody else. You know, number one, we have uh, a great project. It's you know potentially one of the first that's going to go wide mass mass market, mm-hmm. and uh, you know our CTO is probably one of the best recruiters that, that I've ever worked with in the, in the tech space. So uh, to me, it's finding resources or the team or the skill set we need is, is not really an issue. Right. Now, Ben, Asia, I want to talk to you about this. Now, Asia mm-hmm. is the predominant marketplace when it comes to collectibles. Um, certainly the CEO knows that and I would imagine Alfred too. So what's being done to build out this community engagement and this awareness of the collectible uh, connection, that, in, in, that intractable um, notion that these new tokenized economies can facilitate a digitized uh, collectability uh, asset? How are you spreading the word through Asia where often, just like we see crypto casinos emerge in this love affair with um, uh, you know, playing games, they also do tend to like collecting things more so than most parts of the globe. Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, we have found everyone worldwide is quite impressed by the, the demos they've seen so far, but the 
Asian community, when you physically show them uh, your phone and an AR demo, mm. they can't believe it. They love it. And obviously heavily focused into crypto as well. Mm -hmm. So we do have marketing teams currently working throughout the uh, Korean and other Asian markets. Mm -hmm. And although I can't tell you right now, in a couple of days, you'll see me make a pretty big announcement that's uh, going to open up to the entire Asian crypto community. Okay. Uh, well, that for right. you. Sorry. Right. Thanks for that, mate. Thanks for not putting it on my channel. Appreciate no that. Problem. Yeah. <laughs> I want to thank you both. It's been really enlightening to understand all the different facets you're building. Again, this was an entirely free interview for the specific reason that we wanted to find out legitimately what the Ecomi team are doing. And Ben has done something quite rare. As an advisor for many projects in the past, he stepped up to the camera. Not an easy thing to do, mate, and I appreciate you that you've done it um, because obviously now your, your face is out there, not just your name. And Dan, yeah, thank you again for making your time. Day. I, I appreciate it and um, if it's possible hopefully we can follow along and do some updates in the future to let mm. people know what the Ecomi team's doing. Good luck with your launch and I mean that only because from what Ben's saying and you've explained it too Dan that you are choosing uh, an exchange for potentially the right reasons. Now I, I'm an objective speaker but it's good to hear that kind of narrative because I want to personally see that narrative change from the bullshit to the real shit. So thank you again guys for changing the game and leading something out. I wish you all the very best. Thanks a lot, Brad. Appreciate your time. You're welcome.